はい、それではあの時間がちょっと過ぎておりますので、えー、始めさせてあいただきたいと思いますよろしくお願いいたします、えー、このセッションは、えー、セッションに入りましたら英語でさせていただきますけれども最初のご挨拶だけあの日本語でさせていただきたいと思いますどうぞよろしくお願いいたします、えー、私はあの NHK の国際放送という24時間英語とそして多言語で放送している東京から世界160カ国に向けて放送している部署におります江原美希と申しますよろしくお願いします、えー、今日は、えー、世界から世界からというかアジアから4人の著名な方々をお迎えしてこれからまあアジアがそして世界がどうなっていくのかというところをお話ししていただきたいというふうに思います。はい、so my name is Miki Ebara. I work for NHK Japan's public television station's、uh, English arm called NHK World.、Um, so when we look at what On TV or internet、uh, news in Japan or from all over the world,、um, we are bombarded with bad news. The war in Ukraine,、uh, it's, you know, uh, and um, uh, COVID, disrupted supply chain, energy crisis, food crisis, what have you. And the weak yen. Which might be a little、uh, good news for some, but bad news for us.、Um, but we must look at what is beyond that and how can we make a better world,、um, is what I would like to discuss with our distinguished guests today.、Uh, let me introduce you, our guests.、Uh, on the very left from you, Uh, Ms. Priti Up Up Upala, founder of the Omnia Institute, India, but she's based in Los Angeles.、Uh, and on my left, Ken Shibusawa, CEO, Shibusawa and Company Japan. And on my right, Mr. Michael Yeo, President KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific Malaysia. And、uh, Richard Hames, Chief Strategist, Eternus Group Australia. Welcome, everybody. So, my, <laughs> my first big question although our given theme is Asia's flux across several fronts, but first I would like to give each of you five minutes with this question Is the world at a turning point, and how so? Pretty first. The billion dollar question.、Uh, namaste, everyone. Ohayo gozaimasu.、Um, honorable ministers, your excellencies, global leaders, and distinguished guests, I am delighted to be in Japan and I am delighted to be on this opening plenary session to kick off this year's Asia Summit at Horasis. So, good afternoon and welcome. I would like to start answering your question with a quote. The future of Japan's economic growth depends on us having the willpower and the courage to sail without hesitation onto the rough seas of global competition. The late, great Shinzo Abe san. So, is the world at a, at a turning point? Well, there is a very obvious and irreversible shift, I think, that we are witnessing. And this is in the balance of the power、uh, in the world today. So, post COVID and even post conflict, I would, I would add, the power is shifting. Powers of yesteryear are not going to be the powers of today or the powers of tomorrow. We are no longer a unipolar or a, or a bipolar world. Instead, we, we enter into the universe of multipolarity. And as we enter this, I think we're forced to reevaluate the,、um, the, the global order, as it were.、Uh, I like to call it the great reshuffle of powers that we're witnessing. It's a long time coming. 
I, I believe that the center of the world is no longer Europe. Uh, I think somewhere deep down, Europe must realize that it's not the center of the power and must grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems and that somehow the world's problems are not um, Europe's problems. It is 2022 and the top three economies in the world in terms of PPP at least are um, China, US and India. By uh, 2035, the top three will have shuffled a little bit. It's gonna be uh, China, India and the US and by 2040, 55 of, um, percent of the global economy will be in Asia, and the top two will be from Asia too. So I've always said that this is the Asian century, really the Asian decade, but the next 50 years will be um, seeing how Asia manages this uh, great opportunity because it affects the world at large, and I think something that we should all be paying very close attention to. And as these economies, uh, look, the two of the top three economies happen to be in Asia, they also happen to be the two most populous countries in the world, India and China. As they uh, get even more stronger and more powerful, they will undoubtedly dominate in the world of global economy as well. So what sort of Asia are we gonna inherit? Is it an Asia that's gonna succumb to the whims and fancies of the West? Or will it be an Asia that is exacerbated by you know, family feuds of, of, um, of Europe or the proverbial West, I, I should say? It's a, definitely a crucial decade for Asia, for Asia's transformation. And I think there needs to be a real reassessment of national priorities uh, and to put the country's citizens um, as the most important thing, and they have a duty to their own citizens. Get the priorities right and get back on the right track. Beyond just numbers and statistics, I think the real question is this idea of who is really the global power in the world today. I mean, is it really the U.S.? Is, is the U.S. showing the world the way? Uh, do they uphold morality and ethics more than any other nation? I think that's a highly debatable um, question. So in many ways, I think Asia's pragmatic realism uh, contrasts uh, and I think is of more value and worth than sometimes the empty rhetoric that we see on the other side. I think uh, that when we look at where the world is today, it's absolutely at a turning point. The world is changing and I think there's new powers that have come up, new ways of being new leaders on the horizon. Um, in fact, I look at India as a great example of truly an emerging power that needs to step up and uh, um, show the, the way a different way. And I think it, in the past it hasn't expressed itself uh, clearly enough, but this is an opportunity for it to do so. Um, the ability of India, China, and the US to work trilaterally um, is great. And it's one of the novel elements of the changing Asian landscape. Japan has been a great civilization in the past and it should draw from its lineage and its legacy to redefine itself in the 21st century and become a commendable power. India needs to do the same. And there's no reason why they cannot. Specifically talking about India, I think um, it's a sweet spot. Fastest growing economy, highly digitalized, um, powerful military, has the scale and scope, will be the second largest GDP in the world soon, is the only post-colonial nation to have remained a democracy for all of its years of independence. In many ways, it is also becoming the voice of the global south. And I think this Indian way needs to emerge more. And what is the Indian way? Well, it's keeping, um, you know, trying to do the right thing in the world, not taking sides, but uh, looking at your own uh, national interests and making sure that your 1.4 billion citizens are taken care of. Um, and this Indian way will be, hopefully, will set an example and navigate through the rough geopolitical tides that are ahead of us. Um, of course, we'll talk more in great detail of um, some of the most specific steps that 
countries can take and so on. But this is just a brief introduction for, for my, um, uh, my brief in, in the panel of we are absolutely at a fork, and I think it's a long time coming, and I think it's a good thing, and I think it's a time for Asia to truly step up to the global stage and be the real power that it can be in the world. I think the world awaits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Preeti. Um, your quote, the center of the world is no longer Europe. Then, Ken-san, where is Japan? And also, is the world at a turning point? Okay, thank you, Miki-san. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you outside of Japan, welcome. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Um, and congratulations for the conveners to uh, arrange this uh, wonderful forum. Um, I know it's been a long time um, since this was actually being planning. Um, this facility, I think, was probably, I would imagine, made about 30 years ago. Uh, back then, um, Japan was called number one. Um, we didn't realize then that the world was changing then. And then the, after the next 30 years, uh, Japan basically fell off the map. Um, I'm here to be a little bit prov provocative and say, hey, actually, there might be a positive Japan story as the world is changing right now. Um, the way I see it, um, back in 1990, that's the peak of the bubble. Um, I was born in 1961. Um, for that 30 years, from 1960 to 1990, basically it was the years of prosperity. There was no argument about that. Um, okay, if you look back another 30 years, from 1930 to 1960, what was that? It was a period of war, um, and war is destruction. Lots of pain and suffering, um, but because of the war, there was, a, there was a great reset, and because of the great reset, maybe the next following 30 years prospered. Um, so let's go back another 30 years, 1900 and 1930. Um, at the beginning of that 30 years, um, we had the Russo-Japanese War. And in that war, it was basically, it was a message to the world that Japan, an emerging country, had joined the powers of the West at that time. Um, go back another 30 years, and this is what we call the Meiji Restoration. Um, Meiji, what was the Meiji Restoration? Prior, there was three centuries of Japan's isolation and feudalism, um, and that sort of way of life, way of uh, the society was actually, was destructed, reset during the Meiji Restoration. Um, and so my thesis is that actually, Japan's future, looking back, was never a straight line, but there was this rhythm of destruction, pr uh, prosperity, destruction, prosperity. Um, so my provocative <coughs> positive spin is if, if 1990 was the start, what we call the lost decades, um, but maybe it wasn't the lost decade, but it was three decades of, quote, destruction. And if this rhythm wavelength is going forward, guess what? 2020, we should have been entering the new world of Japan's prosperity. Now, who in the audience believes that story? A ah, couple of hands, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, obviously Japan's got lots of problems. There's lots of problems in the world, um, but if you think about it, it kind of looks like this rhythm is going on. And why, why I, I thought about this rhythm is the fact that I, I saw this rhythm about 10 years ago, and I was looking at one data, and what that data was, it was basically Japan's demographics. Um, so basically Japan prospered what we call the Showa period, uh, from, which started around 1930 actually, all the way through almost at the end of 1990. Um, this was the population bonus pyramid, <laughs> and we prospered. Uh, most of that prosperity came in delivering uh, mass production goods, uh, mass consumption goods with mass production. Um, we were so successful <coughs> that the United States and other countries got mad at us. <coughs> um, so we, you know, it was called Made in Japan back then, but we got a lot of bashing. So around from 1990, actually, there was a new period of the emperor called the Heisei period. And at the beginning of the Heisei period, we got a lot of bashing. So we, Japan, said, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. We'll make it in your country, made by Japan. So we went from made in Japan to made by Japan in your country. Very rational model. But as I mentioned, during that 30 years, it went from Japan bashing to Japan passing. 
So that was that, those 30 years. And so for me, <clears throat> looking at the population demographics, what happened in the Heisei period was, was a, this double-barreled uh, baby boomer, post-baby boomer, that kind of population pyramid that basically shifted upwards. So there was no really big change in the society per se. From 2020, uh, what's, ha what's gonna happen? It's gonna go reverse pyramid very, very quickly, which tells me we're entering to a period in Japan where we have never experienced such large-scale uh, speed of change in demographics. Um, and in that scenario, we have lots of less younger people compared to older people. And people see that and say, oh, Japan's over. Um, I think Elon Musk said that we're just disappearing from the face of this earth. Um, I would argue that Japan will probably be longer around than Elon Musk or maybe even Tesla. But, <laughs> um, but, but that's, a, that's the usual story. And, and it's true. I mean, that's going to happen. Um, but to me, this... 30 years going forward, um, when we go into this reverse pyramid um, with much less younger people, I think Japan needs to be, cha be changing that model from not made in Japan, made by Japan, but made with Japan. And the reason why I say that is because the younger generation, we have fewer people here. But if you ask anybody in their you know, mid-30s to 20s to 10s, do you ever remember a day going by when you couldn't access your internet? I mean. When I was 20, I had to dial up for internet. Who remembers that day? You know, we, yep, we did it, we dialed up. You know, it wasn't connected. But now, we're, we're connected. We're in a connected world. We talk about digital transformation, but the younger generation, they don't need any transformation. It's already built in, right? Um, and in, in, in terms of languages, um, these Google uh, or other um, um, tr automatic translators, <clears throat> the, the level has gone up a lot in the last compared to the last 10 years to present. So language is going to be less of a problem. And so for me, the younger people in Japan, if they figure out that, well, yeah, I live in Japan, I work in Japan, hey, but through the, through the internet, I'm connected with the world, what do they see? <clears throat> they would probably see that actually they're not population minorities that if you look at the world, the world is very, very young. I think in India, I believe the medium age is around like 28. I, I think Indonesia was 29, very, very large population. Um, Africa, medium age is 20. Um, and, and this is where the population growth is gonna be happening for the next 30 years. It's very, very obvious. And, and what do these young people want? They want a good, you know, they want to get a job for once. They want to get a job, and they want to be, you know, they want to support their family, <clears throat> the basics. But because it's the basics, and there's that room for economic growth, but many of them live in dire economic, social situations, um, and so they may, may may not be able to um, achieve that kind of um, normality in a sense. So that's where I think in Japan, whether you're a large company, small company, whether you're a company based in Tokyo, where I'm from, or Kitakyushu, I mean, there's lots of ways where we can support the livelihoods of people all around the world, um, lots of ways that we can contribute to a sustainable society. And to me, <clears throat> if, if Japan can switch that switch inside the head and minds, the younger generation, um, I think we'll be in a very, very interesting time. Um, but as I mentioned, we have lots of problems. <laughs> we always have lots of problems. That's why we can't do it alone. That's why it's made with Japan, w with the world. Thank you very much. So made with Japan is Kenson's word. Thank you. So Michael, you are based in Malaysia. Um, from your perspective, is the world at a turning point? Uh, thank you, Mickey. Yeah, I do certainly think that we are at a turning point. I think there are several scenarios, several reasons that we could elaborate why we are so. Firstly, I'd like to say that the whole world is facing VUCA challenges, vulnerable, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world that we are facing. And, and, and because of that, and the, the conflict in Ukraine, the ongoing trade and technology war between the US and China, hopefully that can be overcome with the recent summit last week between President Xi and Biden, that could be improved. 
But these are turning points that we have to address and, and that we need to also take into account that the global economy is facing tremendous challenges. We we'll probably go into a recession next year and we will have rising inflation, rising interest rates that we have not seen for quite a while. And I think those are again economic turning points that we need to address and, and to look at. I think for many of us in Southeast Asia, we are now faced with making choices. The question we are asking is, do we or should we be made to choose between the US and China or China? Because both the US and China are our long-term economic partners, they are our friends. We want to have good, strong relationship between both US and China, and we do not want to take sides to be either pro-China or pro-US. If given a choice, we would rather be pro-business and pro-growth. So I, I would think going forward, we need to see a more multilateral and sustainable global world order, one that is not dominated by a unitary power, but, but having multipolar sources would, would ensure that multilateralism will continue to grow and be placed in greater importance. And two weeks ago, the ASEAN summit, the ASEAN leaders met in Cambodia and also with the leaders of the dialogue partners with Australia, China, Japan, US, India, and, and Canada, New Zealand. I think what we need to focus and think about for Southeast Asia in particular, we need to re-emphasize what perhaps was the norm 40, 50 years ago when Southeast Asia or ASEAN came up with the zone of freedom, peace, and neutrality. We need to re-emphasize, re-prioritize that and, and to again focus on the need for Southeast Asia to be a region of non-alignment. I think this message was put forward very strongly by Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew at the ASEAN Summit uh, two weeks ago. We, we also see perhaps what I would categorize as the three I's and three E challenges that Southeast Asia, perhaps most of Asia, faces. The three I's being inflation, interest rates, and investments. Southeast Asia continue to depend considerably on FDIs and investments. But we are pretty pleased to note that in the last two years, the FDI flows into the ASEAN countries have exceeded that of the FDIs going into China, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, and Eastern Europe. So the three I's are important. The three E's that we need to address are the economy, education, and employment. We need to have strong, rapid economic growth. We need to have new talent because we are faced with human capital challenges, so education plays a very important role, and employment, creating the jobs of the future for the younger generation. We are, we are into a situation, perhaps, where we have a new cohorts of uh, people, graduates who are not able to get jobs. So creating jobs of the future is very important. And, and my worry about the new growth in digital technology and digital innovation is that it may not create the jobs that manufacturing has created in the past. So we could be facing a situation of jobless growth. But nevertheless, we need the digital economy to drive the future growth of Asia. <coughs> and it is interesting, perhaps, to take note of a recent study done by Tomase in Singapore and Bain and Company that the digital economy in Southeast Asia is expected to exceed over US 600 billion by 2030. So that creates a lot of opportunities for uh, suppliers, for vendors, for consultants, and for companies across the globe to come in to take note of the new opportunities in Southeast Asia. One final point that I'd like to mention is the United Nations ASCAP, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, has at the beginning of this year, 
adopted what it calls the Asia New Green Deal. I think that is important because it prioritizes the importance of the green economy for the development of Asia to, to focus on new opportunities in green energy, green production, green supply chains, green financing, and, and green and smart manufacturing. So these are the pivot that Asia and Southeast Asia needs to take to keep uh, pace with the new challenges. If I can just uh, make one final point, and that is arising from the Ukraine war and from global uncertainties, I'd like to propose that perhaps Asia should develop what I would call a new stockpile initiative, where we need to be able to develop and maintain stockpiles of food, health, equipment, health supplies, energy, so that we are able to have food, health and energy security. And, and this requires PPP, public-private and people partnership. And perhaps I would suggest that this can be the new initiative that the RCEP countries, the regional comprehensive economic partnership countries, needs to embrace to, pre to prepare for future global supply chain disruptions and to build back better. Thank you, Mickey. Great, thank you so much. So, on to you, Richard. Uh, please tell us what your view on what sort of turning point are we in? Well, I certainly hope it is at a turning point. I'm 77 years old. So, in reviewing my life, and as the founder of the Center for the Future, where we try and find patterns in our current civilizational model, I've come to the conclusion that we are being led by the least capable among us globally, and that the decisions being made, perhaps over the past 75 years, but certainly more recently, are putting the entire human project in jeopardy. And yet, this is not talked about. In listening to the conversations that are happening here, we have been captured by politics and economics and the models that are actually failing us. We are so saturated by propaganda that we've got to the point now where we can't even think critically for ourselves. Now, I say this not as an opinion, but out of the construct that we use at the Center for the Future, which is not to rely on a litany of opinions, but to actually use artificial intelligence and algorithms to scan literally hundreds of millions of documents that are available online in any language, in any format, to arrive at some kind of precy or summary of the patterns that we see in our civilization today, irrespective of where we actually live in the world. And so these patterns seem to indicate two very important things, and one I've mentioned already, that the conversations we have are not the kinds of conversations we need. They don't go deep enough. They don't challenge enough. They are non-critical. And the level of propaganda is such that we're all propagandized to the extent that we actually cannot see any longer what is the truth and what is not. And of course, the major powers in the world are using that to their advantage. Uh, propaganda has become so pervasive that it really doesn't matter where we live, we are saturated by the propaganda of the moment in the moment. The other thing that's important, I think, for us to realize and reset the framework for any conversation is that we have, over my lifetime, remember, I've gone from a world where there were two billion people to now, uh, last week, according to the UN, eight billion people. So I've seen that increase. And that's, to a great extent, why the systems that were designed 200 years ago 
are no, no longer working for the benefit of humanity. They work for a few, uh, but that's that. And if we look at the global south, and I, th I think that's a better label of, of division. If we're talking about divisions in society, I think the West and the East is fairly misleading because when we talk about the West today, we're actually talking about a Western empire led by US hegemony and the desire to be the leading hegemony in the world and ignoring the fact that the future must be with the unheard voices of young people throughout the global south. And I think that's an imperative. The summary of that is that we are being led by three pillars in the civilizational model, three pillars that no longer work today. Look at this room. One of those pillars is patriarchy. The dominance of men in this world has created a world designed by men for men. Men are the default mechanism. That's why, Mickey, I wanted to ask forgiveness of this audience before I spoke in advance. 50% of humanity is not heard because of that model. The second pillar, which is equally devastating, and perhaps even more, is colonization or neo-colonization. We still exist in a colonized world where, as, as Preeti has pointed out, Europe still, and I was educated in Britain, although I'm Australian, still thinks of itself as the dominant force in almost everything. And it was very instructive for me on my most recent visit to, to Britain, which in, is in a state of collapse, there's no doubt about it. All the evidence points to this old empire being in a state of collapse. Still, in spite of everything, in spite of all the evidence, believes that it is superior to everyone else. And in Westminster, of course, you have the creme de la creme from Eton, particularly. The third pillar, which I think is something we're going to have address, but we don't even talk about it, is the fact that capitalism, as practiced today, not as originally conceived, has brought us many benefits and is now toxic. It no longer serves humanity as a whole. And so what do we do if we're trying to think from first principles of a kind of economics that will benefit everyone, everyone in terms of the eight billion people we have now on the planet? So in conclusion, I think I've seen over my lifetime whatever moral authority existed in the West from the time those two bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that moral authority, if it existed at all, has been eroded and has drifted towards the East which is an opportunity for Asia. It's one of the reasons I live in Asia, because the opportunities are there for Asia in terms of, I would, not to exaggerate, rescue the human project. If you look at tensions that exist, we automatically go to trade or at the economy or whatever it is between uh, various empires. And you can see in the cosmological origins of the West, which were very evangelical, reinforced by principles of the 18th century enlightenment in Europe, uh, of debate, right, left, black, white, all of those kinds of divisions. And then the whole notion of individualism, that's encapsulated in the Western worldview. And you compare that with the Sinic worldview, which is grounded in Taoism and Confucianism. It's communitarian, it's not individualistic, and it's secular. Just in those two models, one of which is in decline, and, and we're trying to ignore it or deny it or fight back, which is all the war rhetoric, 
the language of war and we will overcome, and the language used by and the, the ethos of the other derided by the West, even in Xi Jinping's uh, Common Prosperity Project. Perhaps we take it on face value. Perhaps it will lead to more common prosperity. So I think the transformation that's coming, and I think it's inevitable, will either lead to the destruction of the civilizational model, not necessarily extinction of the species, but close to it, or it will actually transform, metamorphosize into a different model for humanity, which will be empathic, abundant, and serving humanity as a whole. So the answer to your question, I hope so. Thank you very much, Richard. So I think we all agree that we are at a shifting point, but what, is, what would be important is so what future should we create or try to create, right? And so my next question would be, then what can Asia offer for the period of uncertainty of the world? The, uh, another billion dollar question. Um, it's interesting, I think the beauty of Asia is there's a lot of civilizations that exist that have existed for thousands of years, 5,000 years plus, and these civilizations have inherent wisdom that are as relevant, I think, as they are important and necessary today than they've ever been. Uh, that these are timeless, eternal, um, you know, philosophies and perspectives that have stood the test of time and actually are need, very much in need today. So I think we can definitely touch on what ha is universal, what has worked and what could work um, you know, in the world today. Uh, I wanna briefly talk about a few different points. Uh, just more specifically, the Quad um, is a great example of one such, I guess, collaboration between, um, I guess, cross uh, different regions in the world. I mean, Quad obviously is this geostrategic um, alliance between uh, Japan, the US, Australia, and India. And um, they are set to pay a, play a great role uh, in the coming decades, so we shall keep a watch out for that. Um, Lloyd J. Austin, who is the Secretary of Defense of the United States of America, has repeatedly said that this is a US grand strategy and um, that, their, that their grand strategy is in the Indo-Pacific and that the Quad is central to the strategy and India and Japan are key to, that, to the Quad. So I think these two countries must really work a lot more together. I think they can contribute vastly. Then of course there is the BRICS. I think this is the future of the world. You know, BRICS um, is not just um, a, a metaphor, it's not just a sound bite or a, or a, a meme. I think you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist or a, a astrologer to predict that the future of the world economically, you know, will be dictated by the BRICS. They will be at the forefront. But these countries need, need, need to rise and step up to the plate. And also I think there needs to be a bit of humility from the West to accept that there are other sane voices, other leaders um, or other nations that have good ideas and that they can be you know, powerful and can lead us in a, in a, to, a, to a better world, so to speak. So I think it's, it takes two to tango and I think there's a need to step up and also a need to be more humble. Um, I mean, if there's one takeaway from the recent G20 summit, it is that Globalization is over. The, the US um, dominance is just steadily sort of, at least, I won't say declining, that's not, that wouldn't be right, but it's, it's plateaued to a point, and this makes up room for other great powers to emerge. The world is truly um, multipolar. Asia is being shaped largely by the outlook of the US, the power of China, the weight of Russia, the collectivism of the ASEAN region, the volatility of the Middle East, 
and of course the undeniable rise of India. So again, I'll just touch on the Indian perspective. I think what India can offer is something unique. Its worldview is by nature consultative, democratic, and equitable. Uh, needs to find clearer expression, but this would be the time to do it. So um, I do think that the global south is a perfect term and it is excruciatingly important for us moving forward. 2050, the world will look very different than it does today um, and the, the powers that will be leading the world will, whether you like it or not, will be very different to the powers that lead it today. That's just um, mother nature in a way taking its, its course. And I, I do think that it's important that as a collective, as a humanity, we realize that we have a great opportunity here to, you know, I think set ourselves for a, a, a better world. And uh, look, nothing beats the truth and love and, uh, you know, freedom and, and light and all those beautiful things. And again, they're not just talking points. I mean, it's, it's very much a pragmatic and, and can be very real for the world as well. I think cooperation, dialogue, um, peace, is, is important. Uh, it's very sad to see in the face of war well, where there are so many countries who are almost pushing for more war and a worse off a, a warlike situation. Um, the sane voices, the few sane voices that were asking for dialogue and peace were completely sidelined, right? And it's sad to see that I think those voices need to be louder as well. And the only way really is peace and uh, come to the, to the high table and, uh, you know, hash it out there. And there is a better way for us out there. And I guess that's why we're gathered here. But, but this is where it's all going to happen. And I think you are all a part of that. So get engaged in geopolitics and foreign policy of your countries and the world at large. And let's make it a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Very important message. Thank you. Ken-san, you said Japan especially. Uh, we might be at a threshold of new prosperity, but what holds the key for further, you know, to, to make this country and also the Asian region prosperous? Right. Thank you, Miki-san. Um, I introduced the concept of made with Japan, and, and currently I'm trying to execute on that model by uh, launching a impact fund. Impact fund is not just economic returns, but the intent to have positive economic, I'm sorry, environmental and, and social impact, um, and actually into Africa. Under the endorsement of the Japan Association of Corporate Executives, Keizai Doyukai, which is an association of about 1,500 corporate executives um, from about 1,000 large companies and, and not, not so large companies. Um, the reason why I look at Africa um, along with Asia is, as Priti mentioned, in 2050, uh, the population of Asia is going to be over 50%, I believe. Um, Africa actually is currently about 1.3 billion um, people. That's going to double. Um, that's about that's 25 percent. So if you add Africa and Asia together, that's over 75 percent of the population will be from Asia and Africa. Um, and the reason why I look at Africa is because the population growth momentum <coughs> is is actually much higher than compared to actually in Asia. Um, and um, and and actually many players other than China has actually low, not so large uh, presence in, in Africa. And, and um, India has always been, you know, very, very uh, strong in East Africa, but in, in, along the entire continent. Um, and when I go to the African, I went to the African Development Bank uh, in Cote d'Ivoire a couple of weeks ago, and I said, well, Japan 150 years ago was an emerging country. Uh, we, unlike Africa, we didn't have natural resources abundant, other than maybe water, um, and, and actually we had people. Um, and actually with that natural resource called human capital, um, we were able to raise from the feudal state in, into a modern state. Um, and we did it through with what? With actually democracy and actually capitalism. 
And, and as mentioned, there's lots of problems with democracy, lots of problems with capitalism, but I'm not, I'm not ready to give up on it yet because I think there, there is, there is you know, a, a, a solution if we can get all together on this. And so um, to me, uh, how, uh, don't give up. <laughs> don't give up that you know, by, by having impact, not just, not just for the economic return, which is very, very important, but having positive impact on the society positive in, in, impact on, on, the, on the environment um, with the Asian story. And frankly, a lot of African people look at Asia for their sort of success stories. Uh, and in terms of collaboration, Japan and India can obviously do a lot of things together um, in East Asia. You know? and, and, and so um, my message is, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of world do we want to live in 2050 for children and grandchildren? You know, and it should be a better world than it is today, I think. At least we should strive for that. And collaboration and cooperation is very important when people are still very preoccupied with the U.S.-China tensions, correct? Um, Michael, uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was striking was the importance of education and young people. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I think many of us in our countries need major transformation in our education system. Education reforms, I think, is one of the biggest challenges that many of the Southeast Asian countries face. And, and I think going forward, we need to be able to transform our education systems, perhaps focusing more on TVET, technical vocational education, and, and, and looking at preparing graduates for a future-ready world, that they would be able to be uh, future-proof, that they would be able to fill jobs of the future. And, and also, I think it will be necessary for our new cohorts of students to be imbued with the right mental attitudes of, of confidence, of, of leadership, of cooperation, and getting along with one another, uh, not only within countries, but between countries as well. You have something to say about education and young people too, Richard. Oh, I have a lot to say about education. <laughs> I agree with Mike. Um, can I elaborate it a little in terms of your, your previous question to Ken, which I found a fascinating question as well. I believe, and not just education, but I think most of our li most life critical systems are in a state of collapse. And again, there's evidence that that is the case. If you, if you see the patterns that of, of failure that are occurring. Uh, and what a, the, the people who understand complexity and system science really understand that when a system starts to collapse, like education or healthcare or politics or economics, um, when it starts to, to collapse and it reaches a certain tipping point, you can't go back. It has to go through that collapse, and it has to be then generate anew. So the, the point about that is I think there's too much trying to resist what is happening. If you, if you simply take global heating, for example, we know now that the Paris Accord is absolutely ridiculous. One point, limiting uh, global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius is just lost. It's gone. Uh, the most likely target climate scientists believe at the moment is about 2.5. And then would you say, well, in terms of livability on this planet, how does that impact us? And obviously, adaptiveness uh, becomes very, very important indeed. Uh, when parts of the planet, especially around the coastlines, uh, right around the world, become uninhabitable or just submerged. I mean... I think I live in Bangkok, and uh, in 30 to 40 years' time, I will look forward to snorkeling to visit the temples that are underwater. Uh, so, so we're dealing with that kind of uh, problem. Uh, and I think what has to emerge out of that is a regenerative ethos and paradigm rather than an extractionist uh, paradigm. And central to that, I think, are two things. One, that we need to admit 
that humanitarianism is one of the causes, putting, putting humans at the center of everything, is one of the problems we've got. And we relegate other life forms uh, just as to eat or just to corral or dismiss. Uh, so I think we have to re-examine our role in terms of stewarding life generally on the planet. And the other thing, again, which nobody talks about if you're a man, because it's quite embarrassing to talk about that in this kind of context or in, an, uh, in um, a, a government context or an, an organizational context, is the world has to be driven not by hate and competition and growth, but by love. It's very, very true. Um, we are coming to the end of the conference, um, the panelist panel, but because we started late, uh, if everybody agrees, I would like to extend five more minutes to 35. Um, so I would like, but I have to ask you for your last uh, important message to all the audience and, and to the world. Keep it short and sweet. Um, this is so apt. Um, this is a quote from the, um, the Minister of uh, External Affairs uh, of India, Dr. Jay Shankar, and he so eloquently put it uh, in this way. I don't think I can uh, do better than this. This is, he's talking specifically about India, but it relates to Asia as much. This is a time for us to engage America manage China, cultivate Europe, reassure Russia, bring Japan into play, draw neighbors in, extend the neighborhood, and expand traditional constituencies of support. So I think it's time for India to rise and step up. It's time for Asia to rise. It's not just the Asian century, but the Asian decade. So make it count and uh, Godspeed. Thank you, Ken San. Um, you might know that our Prime Minister Kishida, when he started his off, uh, administration cabinet, he launched this uh, concept of new form of capitalism. Um, and I'm on the uh, council member for this new form of capitalism the last uh, year. Um, and frankly, he doesn't get much good achievement award for this, um, from either from the markets, from Japan, or, or overbroad. Um, but what it's trying to achieve actually is, is very, very important, I think, at this juncture in time. It's basically saying a virtuous cycle between growth and distribution. Not just growth, not just distribution, but a virtuous cycle. This gets reported. One other thing that I think he's saying is very, very important, but it's never reported in the press, um, either here in Japan or abroad. And I think this is a very important part of it. And it's basically saying he's not trying to deny capitalism, but it's trying to incorporate externalities that were left behind by corp capitalism, which is the environment and society. Uh, very, very important. Um, an inclusive form of capitalism, um, which is not a new form. It's been talked about for a long time, but I think it's very definitely important in this juncture in, 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 our, in our world. And how do you achieve that new form of capitalism? Um, there's one word that keeps on popping up. It's human capital, investing in the people. Um, and and that, that, that kind of message, I think, it's not just for Japan, but all over the world. Thank you. Michael. I think what's important is when we're talking about perhaps looking towards an Asian century, we need to also be able to create a new narrative of globalization for the rest of the world, as well as for people here in Asia. Perhaps a globalization 2.0, a globalization that is inclusive and sustainable, a compassionate, a, a, a caring form of globalization that builds on cooperation and collaboration so that together we can achieve a lot more out of global cooperation and, and not just have globalization that is just about opening of export markets or capital flows, but a globalization that benefits mankind. Thank you. Richard. Uh, I was going to say something similar to Mike, so I'll change it and allow my Australian-ness to come out. 
uh, I, I hope the future can be designed by young people and particular voices in the global south. And to them, I would like to say, unlike my generation this time, don't fuck it up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, as unpredictability is the new normal, but it also can be the time um, of a great opportunity. But I think in to make it as a great opportunity, we all have to um, create something new uh, if and with the vision. Also, um, because in the previous discussions, uh, late Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe was mentioned quite a lot, so I would like to pay a tribute to him by saying that Prime Minister Abe used to say, this is a time for women to shine, but I would say, this is a time for men to shine, S to be visionary, to go home and spend more time with your family, especially to Japanese people. Um, <laughs> to, to innovate, to, to be innovative and be kind so that we can all have peace and stability in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.